So for the next three Sundays, including this one, I'm going to do something profoundly un-Episcopalian, which is I'm going to preach a titled sermon series. Nobody fall out of your seats. This is something that in the more Protestant churches is relatively common, but maybe not so much in ours. And that means you need to keep coming to church for the next three Sundays to get sort of the whole gist and the whole message of it. But the title and the theme is, What is Faith? What is Faith? Yeah, we'll cover that easily in three Sundays, no problem. Well, today we're going to focus primarily on what faith is not, actually. Faith is not certitude. In fact, I might be so bold as to say faith is the opposite of certitude. We heard it in today's scriptures. St. Paul wrote to Timothy, avoid wrangling over words. In other words, steer clear of controversies over at a minute level exactly what is right, who, what is wrong, who is right, who is wrong. Keep sight of the big picture. Paul writes elsewhere in the first letter of the Corinthians, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Anyone who claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge. Faith is the opposite of certitude. Did you, my friends, know that we are the original agnostics? That might come as news to you because that term in modern language has come to mean somebody who is unsure, perhaps doubts the existence of God, but Christians were actually the original agnostics. It goes back to the roots of the word. Gnosis, spelled with a G at the beginning in the Greek, means knowledge. To be an agnostic is somebody who eschews knowledge. Because in the context, in which our faith first arose, most people thought that faith wasn't really what it was all about. It was actually about literally having a God that you could see and touch in the material sense, a God that your senses could completely understand and envelop. We see this all over the Old Testament in talk about idols made of wood, and stone and metal. And of course, there are uh, very fiery proscriptions against this practice for the chosen people of Israel. But even in the burgeoning reality of the New Testament, we have the Greco Roman concept, uh, context in which gods of flesh and blood literally lived up on Mount Olympus. Now, I think everybody knew this wasn't actually true. But nonetheless, the mythology was so strong that it was considered heretical to suggest otherwise. So when along come the Christians saying, no, actually, the real divine, the real God, is this strange, ineffable mystery, so strange and ineffable as to show up incarnate as a human being, and yet simultaneously be infinitely above and beyond anything human. Well, that was seen as more than a little odd. We were the heretics. We were the agnostics. And yet, my friends, I think that being an agnostic in that sense is actually to practice our faith rightly. See, I believe that there is a God, a creator, a source of all being in which I and you and the entire universe lives and moves and has its being. I trust that that creator, that source, visited us in human form in the person of Jesus Christ. I hope that the life, death, resurrection, and ascension of that Christ is forming us and drawing us all to the heavenly places. But I don't know any of it. Not in a material sense. It always has to exist in the realm of verbs such as believe and trust and hope. And so I, in that sense, am an agnostic. Now, does this have a practical application? I'm so glad you asked. 
many centuries, especially after it gained a foothold in secular power, after its first few centuries, began to proclaim quite a few moral certitudes that I would say were a gross overextension of what we actually received in scripture and tradition. There are thousands of examples of these, but most of them have to do with uh, class and with social status. There was a proclamation of there being a racial hierarchy in the world. Uh, scripture was used as an argument for this, and it was thought to be coming straight from the mouth of God. It was proclaimed as a moral certitude. There was a thought to be a class hierarchy as well. The educated and the wealthy, despite the fact that in many places, especially the New Testament says precisely the opposite, were thought to be more in favor in God's eyes, more worthy of respect, more worthy of being listened to. This was proclaimed as moral certitude. Well, in recent times, the church has very much turned its back on such statements of certitude, and I say good riddance. But I would suggest that we have yet to engage in true repentance from that wrong. Because if I look at today's church, I see us with the best of intentions, perhaps accidentally sliding into a different sort of certitude that is still certitude. If someone cannot claim somewhere in their background to have in some way be oppressed, be victimized, be pushed to the outskirts, if you can't claim that in some way, shape, or form, be it by merit of who you are or what experience you've had in life, I notice our church sometimes beginning to look upon that with a bit of distrust or disdain. Like if you actually do have your act together, if you actually belong to one of the more historically privileged classes, but we're not so sure about you. There might be something wrong with you. There's something about you that we can't quite trust. I would suggest that while I see where that may be coming from, that's just the opposite polar extreme of the wrong that the church committed for so many centuries. It's yet again proclaiming something with certitude. So perhaps true repentance from that and keep in mind, repentance in Greek is metanoia. It's to think above. It's not to take wrong thinking and wrong behavior and simply go to the opposite. It's to actually rise above the plane on which the problem was created in the first place. Perhaps true repentance from this is to return to the agnosticism in which our faith began. A faith that is bold, that is confident, that is full of joy and hope, but always steers clear of making certain 